The construction of the rim and surface of a log function, which we just discussed in the previous video, is not only very helpful to get an intuitive understanding, but it's also quite practical, and we will exercise it in what follows. This approach, however, is not completely satisfactory, because it relies too heavily on visual persuasion. Let us now put these ideas on slightly more solid basis. Although we cannot afford to develop a full self-contained rigorous exposition here, we can at least try to give you some flavor of it. Let us consider a disk chain method of exploring analytic functions. This technique can be compared with exploring a landscape. At the beginning we stand on some point, say Z0, and see the function only in a small region around this point, the region of convergence of its Taylor series. Moving to the boundary of this region, the horizon changes, and we can get access to a new part of a landscape which could not be seen before. Continuing this process, we move around in the complex plane, discovering more and more territory where a function lives. It is possible that after coming back to our initial point, Z0, we do not recover the same Taylor series we started from. The set of all locally analytic functions obtained this way define a so-called global analytic function, which is not a function in a traditional sense, but rather a set of functions defined in separate pages of a complex plane. The fact that for the globally analytic function two different locally analytic functions may correspond to the same page in the complex plane hints that the usage of a single complex number z to identify our position in the complex plane is not sufficient to recover the behavior of our function. One has to promote z by adding an additional label g. To specify a single of all possible continuations reachable at z. The label g belongs to a countable set, and the Riemann surface is defined as a set of all possible pairs z and g. Here keep in mind that g itself in principle depends on z. At this stage we are still very close to the language of multivalent functions. Attaching a label g is morally equivalent to specifying a particular regular branch of the multivalent function. The crucial step to render the concept of a Riemann surface really useful is to consider the set S of f as a domain of our function f. This is possible because every point z and g of S of f is equipped with g, which by definition is sufficient to find the value of our function f at the particular point z. Moreover, the projection of z and g to z allow us to generalize all the operations of complex analysis from complex plane to a Riemann surface. This allows us to define a concept of analyticity on a Riemann surface, and it turns out that the globally analytic function on a complex plane is analytic in an ordinary sense on a Riemann surface. Let us see how this terminology applies to our previously studied example of a log function. In this case, at each z, all possible values of our log functions are enumerated with integer k g of z is equal to the principal value of the log function plus 2 pi i k. Therefore, the Riemann surface of a log function is comprised of pairs z and k, where z is a complex number and k is an integer. All points z and k with fixed k forms a sheet, sk. Every sheet sk is a copy of a punctured complex plane slid along some line, which allows to connect two adjacent sheets. These connection lines on individual sheets denote the points where the coordinate g of the pair z and g switches between its discrete values. And in our next video we'll study some more examples.